Welcome to the year-end edition. For the next hour, we'll be looking at changes that affected the world of music this year. We mourn the death of Take That. Stomp in the mud at the best of this year's festivals. Party in the streets to the year's best dance tunes. Relive all those naughty things that Oasis did. Recall the argument between the Sex Pistols and Toby Amy's and the fight between Björk and a cameraman. Ask why so many stars got addicted to heroin this year. Look back at Michael Jackson's rather eventful year and show you all those funny moments when stars lost their cool. The year, the year of reunions. Of reunions. Listen, give a shit. We invented it. We write the rules. You follow. In a long line of reunions this year, there were plenty of money-hungry stars looking to cash in, and the Sex Pistols were first in the queue. Quite frankly, the Sex Pistols never really finished properly, and that's what this is about. Put a full stop on it. It might very well be daylight robbery, but, you know, you're here, I'm here. <laughs> and we don't care! Just doing it for the money? No, I'm doing something old because it's still valuable. Why is it valuable now, 20 years later? Well, it might not be to you, but there are people out there that do appreciate genuine originality. You're going to have a bunch of 40-year-olds in the audience. How would you like a nice smack in the head? Not very much. Well, then shut your mouth and get out of my way with that thing. Or I will do it. Thanks. We're going to bring the entire show and just blow the place apart. Yes, Kiss were back in all their makeup, and the four original members had not performed live together for over 17 years. Oh, God. I'm a bit scared, actually. Looks like we're going to have a rock and roll party tonight! The idea was going to be, let's go out and do it again. Let's do it big time, not second class, not half-ass. Remember this song? Well, Bobby, Ralph, Johnny, Michael, Ricky and Ronnie all got together again to reform New Edition. We got back together because we got, you know, genuine love for our, you know, what, what started all of us as individuals, and that's New Edition. Some reunions, however, were not as successful as others, as Van Halen found out when David Lee Roth thought he was back in the band. Every day he would call me, he would call Ed, yeah, he'd could. go, when are, we going, when are we taking this on tour? Close your Dave, Dave, yeah, close we it. haven't even recorded a song yet. When are we taking one on tour? Either he was high and just didn't hear the truth, but he was never told or we never alluded to him being back in the band. And the most successful reunion of 1996, well, it was the Beatles who sold more records this year than they had ever done before, even though one of them was dead. <laughs> One of the easiest ways to make money in the 90s seemed to be to form a boy band. But this year, the biggest boy band of all time split up and were replaced by a bunch of girls. Unfortunately, the rumours aren't true. Um, How Deep Is Your Love is going to be our last single together. And the greatest hit is going to be our last album. And from today, is no more. <laughs> Yes, it happened. 1996 was the end for Take That. Yeah, we can't live without Take That. I can't understand this. <laughs> we do very much care for the welfare of the fans, and if there is any problems, I'm sure we can set up phone lines or whatever. Take that gone, Ireland's boys own was soon hailed as the new kings of the boy band throne. We're not changing into people that think they're superstars or we're not big headed in any way, we're still very much down to work. He 
2017 teamed up with soul singer Gabrielle in search of a more sophisticated sound. We was sort of lads, you know what I mean? But we're growing up now, man. We're coming away from that 17 year old, yeah, you know, I'm hard image, you know what I mean? Because it's not like that, because that's not how you get on in life. Whilst m and got stylish by hitting the catwalks in Paris. And groups of all singing, all dancing young men began to appear all over Europe. But if the boy bands were too much for you, well, the female sex hit back in a major way. Hi, we're the Spice Girls! This is it now, we're here to stay. Yeah. And hopefully if there's a big demand there for us, we're going to keep on going to the brick door. At the end of the day, this Spice Girls is about music, but it's about movement. It is about girl power, about having a good energy, yeah, having, having a, a good laugh, laugh fun, speaking up, being abrupt, being yeah, exactly girl power, what you want to be. Youth, Youth reports. reports. We don't do anything wrong, we just want to dance. You wouldn't think that it would be hard to dance and have fun, but 1996 saw authorities across Europe clamping down on exactly that. They don't like techno, they don't like uh, people like us. In Germany, a GABA club called the Bunker was closed by authorities who claimed it was attracting the wrong sort of people. And the French town of Avignon banned raves altogether as a precaution against trouble, though it hadn't had any such trouble in the past. Switzerland continued the crackdown when a gathering at Ruggieville on June 6th was banned because police were afraid of the noise levels. And in England, traffic problems were used as the excuse for banning tribal gathering from one location. It's a political thing, definitely. I mean, people, you know, the establishment or whatever are, are scared stiff of, of, of dance music. Concern over drug abuse this year gave authorities greater power in closing clubs. In Scotland, London and the supposedly liberal Amsterdam, tough new plans have been proposed to allow police to shut clubs immediately if they find evidence of drug abuse. But ravers aren't just sitting back and accepting these strict new laws. In France, for example, thousands took to the streets demanding the right to rave after Jean-Marc Solerat was fined a thousand dollars and given a five-month suspended prison sentence for organizing a techno party. It will not uh, be done all today, but we are beginning uh, to, uh, to be a real movement. I came here today to ask for my freedom. <laughs> Still to come, Oasis, Jackson, Heroin, the year in rap, and the year's best dance tunes. But before we go to the break, it's worth remembering that quite a few pop stars went through radical changes this year. 1996 saw hair change color, get chopped, get grown, and get a little bit confusing. And as for age, will Alana seem to get younger? The Spice Girls were caught pretending to be younger, and others returned practically ancient. The Who came back with a Gabrielle look, and the Pistols reunited a little older and a lot fatter, as did Madonna, but then she was pregnant. The Blue Tone seemed a little larger than usual, and of course Robbie Williams had a few too many pies as well. <laughs> Jarvis became a waxwork, whilst Liam changed his profession from arrogant rock star to cheeky supermodel. And the few actors gave music a go, without much success. But then the efforts of some musicians weren't entirely successful either. Some were even outshone by a plastic doll that came to life. And one woman took the idea of breast implants to make it big a little too far. But for some, it was clearly necessary. Would Underworld have had such a big European hit? 
if they still look like this? Shirley from Garbage used to look like this. Alanis Morissette used to make music like this. And as for the Spice Girls, well, young Jerry used to do this sort of thing for a living. And this. Musical stars were also given a makeover. Moby went from this to this. Soundgarden's Black Hole underwent a change. And Bohemian Rhapsody was reinterpreted like this. Oh dear. Welcome back to the Year End Edition, where we look back at the year's biggest music events. Still to come, Oasis, Jackson, Heroin, the Year in Rap, and the year's best dance tunes. But first... Hits, Hits of 96. 96. Killing Me Softly was this year's biggest selling rap tune and one of the biggest selling records of the year. And weren't the Fugees lucky they didn't even have to write this song? It was a cover of a Roberta Flack tune and Wyclef had the easiest job in the world. This was his only contribution to the song. But to be fair, the Fugees worked a lot harder on their fourth single. They got Bob Marley's son to sing one of his dad's songs and spend the rest of the time kicking a football around in the studio. <laughs> the drug heroin made its grim return this year. It was the subject of the hit film Train Spotting. It inspired fashion photographers and killed young Europeans. In Italy, for instance, three people a day died from heroin overdoses in 1996. But it wasn't just young people who were destroyed by heroin. The drug also took its toll on the music world. <laughs> In 96, the music industry could no longer ignore what was happening on its doorstep. The rock world was getting caught up in a deadly web of drug abuse. The casualties increasing as the months passed. I overdosed on a lethal injection of uh, heroin, and I believe that they had said that in America there is a bad strain of heroin going around that's making people drop dead, but what they have to realize is there's no such thing as a good strain of heroin. Along with Philip Anselmo, Scott Whelan of the Stone Temple Pilots and Alison Chain singer Lane Staley also overdosed on heroin. It soon emerged, smack was the drug choice for rock stars in 96. If we have an increase in, in, in drug abuse, if we have an increase in, in, in fatalities and, and particularly with heroin, I think, you know, as much as anything, it's, it's down to um, market forces. The cartels are better at getting their product onto the marketplace at a price that can be afforded. But for some musicians, the price turned out to be too high. Smashing Pumpkins keyboardist Jonathan Melvoin's brush with it cost him his life. The news threw the band into shock. Just numbed, literally numbed. I thought I had dropped the phone out of my hand because I couldn't feel my hand anymore. After years in the music business, Dave Gahan of Depeche Mode also fell prey to drugs this year. He told the papers he was, and I quote, hanging on by my teeth. Musicians are particularly vulnerable to drug abuse. Smashing Pumpkins drummer Jimmy Chamberlain was luckier than fellow band member Jonathan Melvoin. He survived his drug overdose, but says, there is a dilemma if you're a rock star. Getting, you know, flown around the world, you know, having, living in an unreality that becomes reality, where you can do anything you want to do and somebody will pay for it. It gives you, you know, it puts you in a mindset that's very dangerous and very self-destructive. In the summer, the industry backlash against drugs began. As much as anything, drug abuse was costing money. When the Pumpkins sacked their drummer, Jimmy Chamberlain, it was as much about business as it was personal. For every person that questions this kind of decision, they didn't sit with him on a bus at four in the morning where he called us all sorts of names. They didn't see him not show up for practice and just completely disappear. They didn't have a recording session with him where he just completely disappeared. You didn't even know if he was dead. And then you hear him reports, oh yeah, he went to the REM concert. But industry measures, like a telephone helpline for rock stars, have been met in some quarters with cynicism. The backlash exists at a very surface level only, and, and yes, when a band turns up with quality material, um, who clearly made that material with a little chemical help, 
the industry is going to turn a blind eye because they want the material and they want to market the material and they want to turn a dollar. The year, the year of, of Oasis. Oasis. Hi, we're an Oasis and here's a look of a band who sound like us, who look like us, play like us, but they've got a hell of a lot more money than us. Not for it! Love them or hate them, 1996 was the year of Oasis. And no matter what Oasis did, it still made front page news. That's the way it is in England, isn't it? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Certain people from the press can have your hand up their ass and you still can't suddenly get it out. It was a year when they won awards. As beans shouldn't present in awards to gonna be. <laughs> the winner is Oasis. They also played their biggest gigs yet in Loch Lomond, Scotland. We love it because we are Scottish. And at Nebworth in England. How many people are you expecting this weekend in total? I think it's eight. Well, it's eight thousand paying. I imagine it'll be about another another ten thousand ligging. Oasis record an MTV Unplugged, but Liam announces he has a problem with his throat and will not perform. Noel decides he'll sing, but then Liam is spotted in a private box with his girlfriend, smoking and drinking. The band begin their ninth tour of America without Liam on vocals, who walked out on the group 15 minutes before they were due to fly out to Chicago. It's, it's very inconvenient, but there you go. I mean, you know, life, life, life isn't easy. That's probably Liam now saying he's left us. Eventually, Liam flies out to America to rejoin the rest of the band. I come first before any and that's my attitude, that right? One week later, Noel walks out on the group on their US tour, fueling speculation that the group has split up. The brothers return home on separate flights with the group's future Liam hanging the in the balance. Up. And that naughty bad boy attitude continued. Liam spat on stage at the 1996 MTV Video Music Awards in America, and then he found himself in even more trouble when he was arrested by the police in London in November. He's going to have to grow up sooner or later. The law of averages says that he can't go on being a knob for the rest of his life. But you never know with the young lad, do you know what I mean? He's a law unto himself. 1997 sees the release of the third Oasis album and hopefully a tour. And I'll leave the last word to Noel Gallagher. I'm part of the greatest band in the world. Am I happy with that? No, I'm not! I want more! <laughs> Youth Report. This year, Denmark became one of the first countries in the world to legalize gay and lesbian partnerships. All of Scandinavia has followed and the rest of Europe is beginning to catch up. In France, some local authorities recognize homosexual couples by giving them a certificate. And in Holland, the Dutch Parliament have voted in favor of introducing gay marriage ceremonies and have taken the first step by allowing couples to register at their local council, giving them almost the same rights as other married couples. As far as gay marriage is concerned, I think it's, well, it's not a question of feelings. I think it's, I mean, it's not a question of imitating and mocking a, an, a, a, a straight marriage or not. I mean, it's all a question of feelings. If you really love the other one, why should you get married? It can be uh, a man and a woman, or a man and a man, a woman or a mo woman. It doesn't I don't matter. It doesn't matter, no. Well, they're quite content on uh, having relationships going on for a few years, so why not just go the whole ensemble? Why not finish it off? Taiwan had its first ever gay wedding in November. The ceremony was a high-profile event, attended by politicians and other important people in Taiwan. In America, it became an election issue for President Clinton. And at the beginning of December, a judge in Hawaii ruled that same-sex marriages were legal, making it the first state in America to recognize such unions. Andrew and Michael got married in Copenhagen. We've had all the support we can get from our families. Well. They might had hoped for a daughter-in-law instead of a son-in-law. I'm, I'm quite sure most parents do, but um, they know this is the way it is, and 
my parents feel really happy that I chose Michael because they like him very much and uh, and my mother loves you so <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> The year, year of festivals. Year of festivals. <laughs> this year there were more festivals across Europe than ever before. From Roskilde to Romania, from Phoenix to Pink Pop. With all types of music, from rock to techno. Then fun fairs, bungee jumping and football. And of course, lots of mud. The festival circuit this summer saw the reappearance of some older artists who haven't performed for years, alongside some of the great new bands. I want to give the audience my heart and soul. It's nice to be on, go on stage and do some really heavy stuff and just be uh, be really mad and, and, and fun, but it's nice to just kind of sing as well, you know. places so it'll be trippy there's a lot of energy out there right now do you guys enjoy festivals in general yeah we love them it's really good it's really good yeah. why um, just to mix mix sort of people um, and it's not a rave and it's just a uh, just open-minded people, different types of music really, so that's what we like it. Oh, you can turn your high, or turn your board. While established rock events like Roskilde had crowds of between 80 to 90,000, the techno scene continued to grow with 30,000 ravers at tribal gathering and an estimated half a million people who attended Berlin's Love Parade. But no matter what the music, festivals are all about love and peace and having fun. And that's what everyone did. I love it. I really do love the drink and the, and the laugh and the love and the sunshine and everything that goes with a festival. After the break, Jackson, the fight of the year, the dance of the year, and much, much more. But before all that, did you notice anything strange about videos this year? You didn't? Well, we did. Is it only us at MTV, or has anyone else noticed that video makers seem to have been trying to pull a fast one on us this year? Take Louise's video for Undivided Love, for instance. No sooner was she out of the pool and enjoying a good rubdown, then the Backstreet Boys were getting in on her wet look. At this point, the queue for the video shower was round the block. There was Boy Zone, followed straight after by George Michael, leaving just Mark Owen, who prefers a bath if he can get one. All that water is enough to make you want to go to the toilet. Yes, plenty of bands found their way into the toilet in 96. Uh, is you. But it wasn't all wet. If half of them were jumping in each other's showers, the other half spent the year trying to avoid each other in the desert. Babylon and Sue were the first. Then Michael Jackson. Skunk and Nancy. Metallica, even the Spice Girls made it out in the autumn. But there was another crowd of videos with a little more sophistication than the rest. Slow motion, 
Radiohead started it, but it wasn't theirs for long. The Spice Girls, they got in on it. Well, sort of. Robert Miles fell for it. But Michael went the whole way. Not just slow motion, but black and white as well. That's 96 done with. But what about next year? Could Alanis be ahead of the game, maybe? With her new action video. Already won me over, in spite of me. Or maybe this from the Wild Hearts. Entitled, Red Light, Green Light. Yes. Friend edition, still to come. Michael Jackson, Underworld, The Prodigy and Robert Miles, the MTV Europe Music Awards and of course, that fight. But first... The year of gangster rap. You cannot stay in the same place. You cannot have... The videos with the girls shaking their ass in the 40s, and that's, we've been there, that's over. It's time to move on to something else. Dr. Dre says that gangster rap is dead. He's left the label he founded, Death Row Records, and released a new single, Been There, Done That, in which he dances the tango and spells out a new way forward for hip-hop. Been there, done that, the aftermath. The year had begun well for Gangster Rap. Death Row seemed to have been strengthened when Tupac joined forces with Dr. Dre and Snoop Doggy Dogg. But it was the tragic death of rapper and actor Tupac Shakur in September that overshadowed all other events. Rapper Tupac Shakur is in critical condition after being shot three times in the chest. Rap star Tupac Shakur has had his right lung removed. Tributes are continuing to pour in for the American rapper Tupac Shakur, who died on Saturday. Police in Las Vegas still apparently have no clues on who killed the rapper Tupac Shakur. Cut down by a fatal hail of bullets while stopped at a traffic light near the glittery strip in Las Vegas. Nobody should say whether he was a thug, he didn't represent this, he didn't represent that. God should judge that man. Ready or not. But aside from Tupac, 1996 saw the success of another more cultural stream of hip hop. A lot of kids are sort of trying to imitate mafioso and stuff, and we're just trying to find new forms of power that are like, you know, hip-hop-based, um, black-based forms of power as opposed to other things. The Fuji's album, The Score, sold millions worldwide, and their hysterical Buster Rhymes exploded into the mainstream. Yet since Tupac's death, a conspiracy theory has surfaced. The gangster could still be alive and well, according to Chuck D of Public Enemy. I don't know what's true or what's false. Uh, do I believe or do I not believe? I'm just naming things. If, if, if it is true, it's not going to hurt Tupac's image at all. All I know is that he becomes Elvis. Whether Tupac is alive or not, gangster rap is sure to live on. Biggie Smalls has an album scheduled for release in 1997. Ice Cube's West Side Connection have brought the gangster vibe back with the new album, Bow Down. In prison for parole violation, Shook Knight is still managing his record label, Death Row, from behind bars. Snoop Doggy Dogg's new album, The Dog Father, may have a brighter view of ghetto life, but Snoop is back to keep the gangster rap alive and kicking. Gangsta rap ain't dead, I'm here, I'm keeping it alive, you know what I'm saying? Those who say gangsta rap is dead is trying to kill off a dream of a million people in America that's trying to strive to get to hip-hop. When people go back to see what we, what we was living like in 1996 and what was going on and how did we feel, I'm almost willing to bet my life, and I am betting my life, and Dog is betting his life, that is going to be our stories that they're listening to. <laughs> Hits, Hits of 96. This theme from a jeans advert started this year at the top of the charts all across Europe. But Babylon Zoo's follow-up singles flopped and all plans for a greatest hits album have been put on indefinite hold. Rumours that suggest that the man whose song helped to sell thousands of jeans was now selling jeans from the back of a car are completely unfounded. <laughs> Robbie Williams went solo this year, but in between singing about his freedom, he also took time out to host the year's biggest award ceremony. Welcome to the 
96, MTV Europe, music awards. George Michael returned center stage after a rocky start to the 90s, winning the MTV Best Male Artist Award. I'd just like to say very genuinely, I'm really touched. Thank you very much. After collecting seven video music awards in America, the Smashing Pumpkins won Best Rock Group in Europe. I'm sorry, I really feel bad because, you know, Oasis should have won this. They are the best band since the Beatles. But uh, thank you anyway. Well, they didn't win Best Rock Group, by the way. The, the music is excellent. Another non-appearer was Alanis Morissette, who won Best Female Artist. Alanis seems top as well. I feel a bit sorry for her to have to play rock music, though. Why, why is that? What do you mean? Um, it's a taste thing. Boyzone didn't win anything, but they gave a great performance, so singing so together with Pete Andre. What a vibe, what a rush, being on stage, man. The thought of a billion people watching it on stage is unbelievable. And it's garbage. Thanks very much. Here you go, Pudgy. Thanks to the amazing people to come to our shows. That's what makes it rock. Thanks to you. Cool. Good night. Ready or not, here I go. The we want to accept this award not in behalf of the Fugees, but in behalf of all the refugees around the world seeking refuge. This is an award for, for a de deserving cause. It's an award for carers and buddies of the terminally ill. MTV, thank you, and we can't forget all of you out there who voted for us. We love you, and we'll see you again next year. Altogether, the show was a great success, but you can't please everyone. When the artists perform live, you know, I think that's the reason to come to a music television show. And, you know, for George Michael, for example, tonight, who won, he didn't perform live, and I think that's a real cop-out. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of Almighty God to kiss the devil's ass. <laughs> What's that all about? Well, this is the devil. This is the devil's ass, and this yeah. is us. <laughs> Youth report. Young people, especially students, are often criticized for being lazy and uncaring, but this year they demonstrated their ability to protest. In Burma, thousands of students risked their lives protesting against the military regime, a regime known for shooting protesters. And in Europe, thousands of young people marched in the streets of the Serbian capital Belgrade to demand democracy and civil rights. In neighboring Croatia, 120,000 young people took to the streets to protest against the clampdown on media freedom and the closing of an independent radio station. In Italy, students occupied classrooms as a protest against cuts in education, and in Israel, students had confrontations with the army during protests against closure of Hebron University. But young people didn't just take to the streets, they also took to the trees. This year saw an increase in the protests against road building and as the going got tough, it was the young people who had the strength to hold on. I'll keep holding on. I'll keep holding on. There you go, look at that mate. You just tie yourself to a tree, you stop them dead. They can't do anything. They can't cut down trees while people are up in the trees and, or tied to them. Hits Hits of 96. If one song captured the hearts and minds of millions this year, it was this band and this song. 
They were direct and frank, telling their millions of fans where they were coming from and what they really, really wanted, which was a Ziggy Ziggah. Everyone chanted the phrase and bought the single, but no one knew what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> After the break, Michael Jackson's year, some very crazy pop stars, and Underworld, The Prodigy and Robert Miles. But before all that, here's a reminder that our favorite stars can be very naughty sometimes. 1996 was the year in which the pop and rock stars fought it out for the title of Worst Behaved Star. Uh. Contenders in the rap world included Tretch from Naughty by Nature, who was arrested for assault, Flavor Flav for drug possession, and the notorious B.I.G. for both. Snoop was up a murder charge, Warren G. was arrested for carrying a gun. Suge Knight survived two-pack shooting only to be arrested for violating a probation order. And Onyx were arrested for assaulting police officers with a carton of Chinese food. The courtroom was a second home for Bobby Brown in 1996. First, he was put on two years probation for kicking a security guard. Then he was charged with drink driving and got into trouble for not paying his lawyers. And after crashing wife Whitney Houston's Porsche, he's still facing a return to court on an assault charge. But Bobby still thinks his wild man reputation is unfair. I think because I didn't talk to the press that they had to make up something, you know, about Bobby Brown. Um, so they built, this, they, they built this picture of this bad guy. But it wasn't just the stars who caused trouble. Fans rioted at gigs by the Ramones and the Fugees. <laughs> Meanwhile, Robert Downey Jr. was caught with narcotics. Slash was found handcuffed to a bed by a friendly female fan. And Oasis continued to be the bad boys of rock. Hey! Whilst old bloke had come up with was this dangerous tackle. But clear winner of Worst Behaved Star of 1996 was Björk for her unforgettable performance at the Bangkok airport. You fall in love. Who'd have thought it? Welcome back to the last part of our review of the year's biggest music events. In this final part of the show, we look back at Michael Jackson's year and at the stars who went just a little bit crazy. But first... The year, the year of year dance. Dance, dance, dance. What's really exciting about dance music now, albums are starting to sell in very large quantities. You get everyone from Tricky to Underworld, even to our own band Faithless. We, we've done nearly a quarter of a million albums now. 1996 was the year that dance crossed from the underground to the overground, when some of the innovative producers and makers of dance music finally got the recognition and cash they deserved. So, I can't get no... Another success story was Underworld, who went overground with their contribution to the soundtrack for the hit movie Train Spotting. Bones Libby was top 20 in Germany for 10 weeks, went number one in Italy, sold 100,000 copies in USA, and went gold in the UK with half a million sold copies. I'm not a pop star, I don't want to be a pop star, thank you very much. You are now, mate. More success followed with the album Second Toughest in the Infants. It won them the Album of the Year Award at Music Magazine Saints and Sinners Awards and sold 400,000 copies worldwide. Bit of a shock. Thank you very much. The Prodigy had their best year yet. It started with Firestarter, which was number one in five countries and top ten in another six. Their new single, Breathe, followed up on that by going number one in nine countries. They won Best Dance at the 1996 MTV Europe Music Awards and Music Magazine's Best Live Act Award. Respect for everybody who um, support the Prodigy. <laughs> The Prodigy have now sold more than 5 million records altogether, and it looks like they're fire-starting the journey to go overground in America too. The success stories of 96 also include Italian Robert Miles, who ruled the dance floors and charts all over Europe with children that sold more than 2.5 million copies. 
Everything but the girl and Todd Tarry's missing that stayed in the American chart for more than a year. BBE Seven Days and One Week also stormed the charts all over Europe. And Chemical Brothers, who entered the UK charts at number one, with a little help from Noel Gallagher. It's weird because there's no pressure on our shoulders because you've got like the best songwriter, you know, in the world at the moment kind of thing. But not everyone who deserved to made the big worldwide breakthrough in 96. Though many came close, like Orbital, Future Sound of London, Howie B, LTJ Bookham and Goldie, who all released an album that gave proof that they are among the finest of the innovative producers around today. Maybe they will get what they deserve in 1997. <laughs> 1996 looked to be Michael Jackson's year. He'd beaten the child abuse allegations, he'd beaten his tranquilizer addiction, he'd beaten all the odds, and he'd married the daughter of Elvis Presley to form the world's most powerful music dynasty. With the world tour scheduled to start in the summer, it looked like the pressure would finally be off in 96. Recovering from his breakdown at the end of 95, Michael started the year the way he would have wanted the most, in thrones in a home from home, Paris Euro Disney. But no sooner had the waving begun than the fairy tale began to crumble. First to go, the wife. 20 months down the line and the marriage that started with so much promise was all over. I just think, nobody thought this would last. Lisa Marie blamed what she called Michael's sick games, claiming he didn't love me. He can't love anyone but himself. We're still not out of spring, and with a mask slipping, Michael, like all jilted lovers, threw himself into his work. The Brit Awards in London, to be exact, Michael even went to the trouble of choreographing a special version of his number one single, Earth Song. Which was a mistake. Paul's Jarvis Cargo invaded the stage because he objected to Jackson's, and I quote, behaving like a Christ figure with the power of healing. Michael was sickened, saddened, shocked, cheated and angry apparently over the incident. He accused Jarvis wrongly of injuring the children. One of the worst things you can be accused of, it's, it doesn't really, it's not exactly something you put on your CV, is it? Brazil, and Michael's down in the dumps again. The dumps of Rio de Janeiro, where filming of his video for They Don't Care About Us in the capital slums is thrown into jeopardy. He doesn't know nothing about those people. I don't think, I don't think uh, he, he's the right person really to portray the Brazilian poor society, you know. A Jackson reunion, one which included Michael, looked more likely in 96. Well, it did to brother Tito. I've been in certain meetings with uh, Michael and uh, the brothers, and we're talking about uh, doing the greatest hits package along with some new original songs. But Michael didn't feel it. He never sang with them, which ironically ended up costing him money. Still, he should be used to that. In 1996, not one month passed when he wasn't being sued by someone. At least he got to meet some of the world leaders. Dressed like one himself, Michael was so excited to be at Nelson Mandela's birthday party, he completely lost his sense of rhythm. September saw the start of the long-awaited history tour in the Czech Republic. Despite erecting statues of himself, like the one in place of Stalin, in the sense of Prague, fans would settle for nothing less but the real Michael. At a record shop opening in Budapest, they went wild, destroying the front of a shop in their excitement. Although a huge success with the fans, almost every stop on the tour seemed to run into obstacles. Most problems centered around countries with strict religious codes. We don't know if he is a man or woman or even uh, he's a black or white. But Australia and New Zealand were to provide the biggest shock of the year. Rumours circulated, then the story really broke. Michael Jackson has got married again. I'm very happy for him. He's found his perfect match, 38-year-old nurse. But two weeks later, Debbie Rowe announced she wanted a divorce. Nineteen ninety-six confirmed Michael Jackson is a man at odds with the world. Two failed marriages in two years, and a need for self-protection so great it resulted in an order for sixteen thousand security guards for his concert in the Philippines. Where does he go from here? Well, that's it, I'm afraid. But before we go, here's a look back at the stars who went just a little bit crazy in nineteen ninety-six. Happy New Year.
It's been a mad, mad year, and I don't just mean a little bit crazy, I mean stark raving bonkers. Take the World DJing Championships. Not only was there a blind DJ present, and whilst the other competitors showed off their skills, one DJ had other ideas. But it wasn't just DJs. Meatloaf shocked the world by announcing he was addicted to spoons. Uh -oh. Meanwhile in Houston, the World Tattooing Convention raised a few eyebrows. And then there was the population of Innsbruck, Austria, who completely lost it by taking the British term, painting the town red, rather literally. All for a simple red concert. Dave Gabba from H Blocks went a bit over the top at a concert in Baskiri, Russia. While psychiatrist David Wheel claimed Michael Jackson may have an ugly complex, Jackson himself claims at the Brit Awards that, and I quote, every minute three million children die across the world. Scientists replied that if that was true, everybody would be dead by the end of the week. Meanwhile, ex-KLF member Jimmy Corti made an audio weapon and sent a herd of cows mad trying it out. And even Dando of the Lemonheads assured us he hasn't been wasting his time whilst it's been away. I jumped into the sun and discovered a squirrel toenail world. And I was like, like scattering and smattering about like with like pesto and like white wine and Brian Ferry. In Russia, Boris Yeltsin was busy doing anything to get young people to vote for him. And if that wasn't enough, the whole world finally went totally crazy over one song, the Macarena. MTV presenters did it. The stars did it. They even did it at the Olympics. Crazy.